Good morning. We're ready to kick off this this train. How is everybody? Are we good? Good, good, good. I'm really excited today. Is everybody else pumped? I don't know if it's, I don't know why. I'm just pumped. That's good. All right, let's do this. Okay, so if you'll forgive me, I have two separate things to say. Are we cool with two, if I keep them short? The first first one is, I was asking the Lord about this morning, because you know, like, it's July 4th, and so everybody's, everybody's excited. And can I tell you the verse that kept coming up in my head over and over and over? It's in Galatians. It says, um, the phrase kept coming, through love, serve one another. Through love, serve one another. And so I was digging that out this morning. Can I read the verse to you? This is in the Passion Translation. Uh, this is Galatians 5, 13. Beloved ones, God has called us to live a life of freedom in the Holy Spirit. But don't view this wonderful freedom as an opportunity to set up a base of operations in the natural realm. Freedom means that we become so completely free of self-indulgence that we become servants of one another, expressing love in all we do, for love completes the laws of God. And I love that because to me that means that we get to operate in a freedom that even supersedes today's holiday. Like, I'm thankful for my country, I really love my country. But today, like, even beyond July 4th, though, thank you, Jesus, for our liberty, we live in a freedom that supersedes it. Like, when we look at what Jesus did, that's incredible. That's incredible. And so I think that's great. And I was even thinking how when we recognize what freedom is, that really is where worship comes from. That comes out of that when our heart is free before Jesus, we just can't help but say thank you. We can't help but be like, oh my word, Father, you are (laughs) inexpressible. You are generous and and good in every way and kind and, and glorious and powerful and majestic and full of life and always good to me. And like his, his, his attributes start to well up in us. So I think in love serve one another is the ultimate way to express his freedom in us right in love serve one another and i kept feeling like in this room today even there is supply we know that there is supply and there is need so please i feel like the father wanted to open that up in us today if there is a way you can serve another today in our time together please do that please do that express that no matter how small the impulse is, if it's a hug, <laughs> if it's eye contact, those little ways, don't treat them with, dis- with disregard or contempt. So, what is in your heart to be sown today? Serve, love. So that's the first thing. The other thing is I feel like there is somebody with us today who has been avoiding eye contact with the Lord for a while. And I feel like the Lord is saying, I'm ready when you are. So please today, let's make eye contact with God. Let's make eye contact with each other and express that freedom, that love among us, right? So Father, we bless you. We love you. We make eye contact with you first. In these moments, we make eye contact with each other. We serve in love, expressing the ultimate freedom of heaven, expressing full life and salvation and abundance, expressing faith (laughs) past our circumstances. Father, we love you. It starts that simple. We love you. We're grateful for every blessing, for every faithful moment, for all of your goodness, for the joy that is welling up in us even now. We magnify your name. We lift you up. We let worship rise up from the altar of our heart, and we let that love, that expression of goodness, that expression of heaven's culture to pour out of us into each other, in love, serving one another, expressing your freedom, Jesus. Thank you, Father.
Give life, you are love.
Hey guys, I just want to do a quick testimony while we're singing this song and the last song about He is More Than Enough. Um, I just need to give Him all the glory this morning. I can't sit still anymore. He is so faithful and in my situation, I'm by myself. My husband passed away, left me with a business to run. And he has given me so much wisdom. I was a stay-at-home mom, you know, for many years, never did anything like that. And I feel like he's just helping me do a really good job with it. I feel like I'm honoring my husband's memory because I'm taking care of our business. Um, when we sang about he is more than enough, even right now in my life, there might be times where I feel lonely. But my prayer is that he will be more than enough so I never find anything else to fill any of those voids but him because anything else is just less than it's it he is the only thing that can fill those voids so that is always my prayer but I just and the other thing is too right now maybe you would say oh I bet you wish you weren't you know in this situation I am so glad I am because I get to see every day his faithfulness and even the smallest things. I would never want to trade this season of my life for anything because every day I get to see every way that he takes care of me. I'm not a sparrow. I'm his daughter. And he is so good and I love him so much.
So, you know, we sang about being content, learning to be content, and we have the opportunity to lift Jesus up in wherever we are right now, whatever we're going through. And some of us are, it's a little more ho-hum, and some of us, we find ourselves in uncomfortable, and uncomfortable is not always bad. (laughs) 
Actually, there's good in it. And then some of us are on, we find ourselves on an adventure, on the verge. And uh, so we just want to, I, I, I want, it's in my heart to pray for those that are like in any of those spots, but especially for those that are, that are on the verge or that are, they feel like they're on the verge of an adventure. And, and uh, we're blessed to have our brother, uh, Kevin Goodwin here and, and his, uh, his daughter, Annalise. And would you guys be cool with coming up and let us pray over you? And then you guys can be representative of that whole bunch that is at the, on that verge of adventure. You don't mind a little spur of the moment, do you? Yay. Welcome to Pennsylvania. These guys are from Honduras. You're, the rest of your family is in Honduras, right? This is your first time in Pennsylvania? Oh, welcome, right? We're glad you're here. And uh, do you want to say anything about what you're doing? Okay. These guys are doing a father-daughter trip from Honduras. Is that correct? Uh, just, I mean, it's more than just hanging out, right? <laughs> okay. No, but you have uh, kind of an agenda. You're thinking about looking at colleges? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty exciting, isn't it? Yeah. So what I was thinking while we were worshiping was we just want to pray over you guys and bless you guys, right? And... And, and uh, I already told your dad that I'm sure you'll make the right decision when it comes to that time, right? But I, I felt in my heart that, that you could, and thanks for coming up, your, your willingness, but that as we prayed, you could be the representative for all of those, not just here in the room and in our extended family, but all across the earth that are in a place of like, you know, it's uncomfortable, I'm not sure, but it's opportunity. And it's on the verge of an adventure. Are you with me? Okay. Because I just feel that. We feel that for you guys. So, Father, we're just thankful. If anybody wants to, like, just, like, come around. These guys are family. Father, we're grateful. You're just really amazing. <laughs> I mean, we sing about it and we remind ourselves, but whew, you're more than we can fathom, really. And just the way you knit us together in you is, and we're discovering that, Lord, it's beautiful. And Father, how many of us, not just here, but across the globe, are right on the verge of adventure, but we don't even see it sometimes. We don't understand it, and we're afraid, or we're uncertain. And often our focus is on that uncertainty, or that fear or trepidation, more than on you. So, you know, we repent of that, Lord. Thank you. And we're willing to just continually turn our eyes to you and trust you with the steps and the path ahead of us because you're always our way, Jesus. And just the fact that Kevin and Annalise are on a father-daughter trip, Lord, isn't that, isn't that what you've called all of us to do? to be on a father-daughter or father-son adventure. It's not just a one-time, like, oh yeah, we did that, you know, long ago. No, that's an ongoing opportunity, Lord, but we don't always see it that way. I forget sometimes, often, Lord, and we repent of that too. So, Father, in our prayer here, we, we, we are just blessing Annalise. In her present for her future and we are blessing her dad Kevin with the same and just the bond between them reminds us of the bond that we have with you all because it's your doing Lord 
And so our pr- we extend our prayer, Lord, to our WHO family, to the body of Christ, Lord, to humanity, because there's sons and daughters out there that are on the verge also, but they've been distracted. They might not realize they're holding back, they're unsure, and maybe just very possibly a lot of them don't have the support that Annalise has. They don't have dad close by. We bless them with strength in your name, Jesus. We bless, bless them with vision from you and faith and hope and, and, and the wherewithal to not give up, but to trust you and step forward, Father. We thank you for our brother. We thank you for his family. We thank you for Annalise. We bless him, Jesus, in your name. Amen. something broader it's something of a deeper consequence than just a decision of where to go to college it's my sense of my heart that if it doesn't feel like walking on water it's not what he had in mind it's that level of freedom it's that level of as the world would call it lack of safety we're literally the laws that govern the natural things need not apply. I bless you to have that level of faith in what the Lord is doing in your life. A trust in His goodness, a trust in His affection for you, in who you are as His daughter. That that trust in His love for you would cause you to easily step out of the boat like Peter did. Like it wouldn't even be a thought. You have that level of trust in his love for you, in his nature. May there still be wisdom, but may it be the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of this world. May that guide you, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, the love of a father for his daughter. I bless you to have both of those securing you so no other security is required. Kevin, you've been a good dad. You are a good dad. We bless you with a rest and a restoration that comes from Holy Spirit. May you be fully restored, body, soul, and spirit, by the one who created you, to walk in your identity, to walk in joy. I ask for the joy of the Lord to be restored to you in a way beyond you've ever experienced before. An inward joy that literally brings life to the marrow of your bones. And it will sustain you for the rest of the days of your life. Thank you for this family, Lord God. We bless the entire Goodwin family. Be rejuvenated in the Lord. Be restored in the Spirit of God. We love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Um, as we were worshiping, I kept seeing hearts as offerings, like as altars. I what I meant to say hearts as altars. And just the Father was just so honoring and loving um, our time with him today. And so, God, we just love you. We love you. <laughs> we love you. We love you. We love you. Every heartbeat, every breath, we love you. We love you. We trust you. You are good. We love you. Thank you. That was really great, guys. Um, can we can we give? I did not look for baskets before I came up. This is one of the ways we we serve and we give, we love. So, Father, we bless um, 
the seed. We bless the little. We love how you tend the ground and how you turn what we have into more than enough. You are full of multiplication and wisdom and vision, and so we just give into your way. We sow into your life and your perspective and your your dirt because <laughs> the way you honor it and the way you multiply it. God, we love you. Please bring up what you have. If you are not already online givers, I'm sure, but if, you're a, if you have it today, you can bring it on up. Okay, two things to remind you about just real quick. The first is that um, uh, the Kahoo kids have their fun night um, Wednesday night. So please bring your kids out for that. Also, registration is open for Who Kids Summer Camp August 9 through 12. Get your kids registered for that. The other thing is tonight in the parking lot, we're going to do fireworks. Well, we're not going to do them. We're going to watch the borough do them. <laughs> Um, but we're going to have s'mores and all kinds of fun stuff. So please come out. We're going to be here at 7. The fireworks are at 9.30. Come park your car. Bring snacks to share. We'll have s'mores here. It'll be great. You guys are having fun tonight. So are you ready? Okay. Everybody, please welcome Mark. All right. I'm going to start in Galatians chapter 4 the last verse of that chapter into the first verse of Galatians 5. This is July 4th, so I probably should talk about freedom. Why not? Seems appropriate. So I'll talk about freedom for a little bit. Um, as I was worshiping today with you all, I really sensed the Lord's longing for what Diane had started out with, with uh, when she said that someone needed to look in the eyes of Jesus. She said like someone was having trouble making eye contact with the Lord. I felt like the Lord was just longingly looking at us to see his eyes, to look at him face to face, to see him as he is. Um, I was thinking about uh, the idea in Christianity that no one can come to the Father except through me, that Jesus said that, Right? You guys know that scripture? And for so many people in the world that do not have a uh, saving faith in Jesus, they would say that that view might be, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Narrow-minded. The idea that there's only one way to God. The idea that there's only one path in order to get to God. And I actually don't see that verse that way anymore. When I hear Jesus say that when like the only way to the Father is through me. And I, I'd like to probably look this up in the original language. I didn't get to do that because I was just in worship thinking it. But the realization kind of hit me that it was less about like an actual physical path that as long as you go the path that is like the belief system of Christianity, then you'll get to go to heaven. Because that has tended to be the gospel. Like, believe the Christian faith and what the Christian faith says, and then you get to go to heaven. Because my relationship with God is literally a relationship now, where I actually talk to a person, and the person talks back, I'm realizing now that when Jesus says that you only get to the Father through me, it's the realization that if you really want to know who God is, be with me. Like, look at me, talk to me, read about me in the scriptures, because I am who God is. 
Like when I hear Jesus say the only way to the Father is through me, what he's saying is, here I am. Like this is him. Like you can go find out, you can read in a book, or you can go talk to somebody else, but if you really want to know who the Lord is, look at me, here I am, I'm right here. I, I hear Jesus saying with so much emphasis and so much like eagerness, if you want to know who God is, and I think every human being deep down wants to know where they came from wants to know like why they exist and what's going on inside of me and why it's going on inside of me. And I feel like Jesus is the answer to all of those questions inside of us. And ultimately, it's like he wants us to know that if there's any view of God that doesn't match him, forget it. Let it go and come and be with me. And I back to that idea of looking in his eyes, relationally. Like, this is real Christianity, what we're talking about here. Real Christianity is less about following certain rules, the four laws, if anybody ever grew up with that, or anything of the Romans road, or anything like that. And really, it's about just spend time talking to the Lord Jesus, who is God, the full representation, the Bible says. Everything that was ever invisible about God is now visible, made known, clearly presented in the person of Jesus. He, he leaves all mystery out now. Like, there, according to the Lord, according to God in the heavenly realm, there is no mystery about God anymore. Just talk to Jesus. Go read about him in the scriptures and then allow that reading to take you into relationship with Jesus. Like, I, I just want to talk about him. And I also want to walk like him in the earth so that people have a physical, actual representation of what he could be like. And I'm working on that. I'm not perfect. Neither one of us are like, and none of us are perfect. But I think collectively, if we really got our crap together, we could potentially represent <laughs> the fullness of Jesus in the earth. Actually, getting your crap together is probably not what you want to do. You probably want to get rid of your crap. Like, I don't understood that, that idea. Like, lose the crap and get your good stuff together and represent him. So, anyway, I really just felt like that encouragement from Diane to look in the eyes of Jesus wasn't just for one. I think it was for us all. Like, if you really want to know his heart, if you really want to know who he is, look at him. Talk to him and let him talk back to you. Something else I was, we were recently in Portland and I remember telling these guys this, if the first words you hear from the Lord when you're like praying and you actually like do hear him talk back and the first words you hear back are corrective or what could be different about you or what's wrong with you, I'm gonna tell you right now, that's not him. That's us. I can promise you this. In my time with the Lord, I, he has shown me that when I, like I'm in prayer and I'm just spending time with the Lord and I'm talking to him and immediately like frailties and weaknesses and all of that stuff come up, that's me. Actually trying to project, I'm not saying trying, but it's projecting how I see myself onto the Lord. Has anybody ever done this? Yeah. Like you don't even realize you're doing it, but the realization is, is that you find out that you're actually projecting your own negative thoughts about yourself onto the Lord, and then we have this perspective that when God looks at us, he sees what's wrong. Has anybody ever felt that way about the Lord? Like, it's almost like the first thing. And the reality is, it's not that he doesn't see what's wrong. He just chooses to celebrate what's right. And there's something about that in the human psyche, in the fleshly part of our human psyche, that cannot get past what's wrong with us. And the Lord is just like wanting to continually highlight, Wayne, you look incredible. Like, I, I love your heart, and I love how you think about people, and I love how you turned your heart toward me this morning. Like, that's the Lord's heart for us. And so part of looking into the eyes of the Lord is to realize that when he looks at you, he really does see the beauty of who you are, the glory of how he made you. He sees you as glorious. Can you handle that? This is really important. 
Because as a human being, if you cannot handle the fact that your father looks at you and thinks you're glorious, there is where a breakdown in relationship begins to occur. And then we begin to put thoughts into God's head about us that he doesn't have about us. And it's a breakdown in relationship. And over time, if we believe that that's what the Lord thinks about us, it becomes harder and harder to look in his eyes. So the beginning of looking in the Lord's eyes is to actually believe what he sees. And he sees really good things. Like when I look around this room today, regardless of any kind of relational dynamic that's going on between you and I personally, I want to tell you, I think really highly of you. I really do strive and yearn to see you as the Lord sees you. And that should be all of our goals. Like church should really be, this environment called church should really be the place where we practice what it's like to be sons and daughters of this father. Am I right? Otherwise, why get together? Is it just this religious practice or do we actually actually get, I just repeated myself, but anyway, we actually get to practice being who we were originally created to be. Originally, before the world had its way with us, before you tried to figure out who you are, God had an idea about you. And the church, family, is where we practice unlearning what isn't us and remembering who we really are. Is that okay? I like that about church. That makes sense to me. Family is learning who we are and understanding who our dad is and getting to kind of re, not just imagine, but actually relive the life we were always meant to live. I think that's a really good reason to be and participate in gathering like this. So I had nothing to do with what I wanted to say today, but that was on my heart through all of worship. So that was free. Your offering was not for that. It was for this. Okay. <laughs> Galatians 4, 31 says this, So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. Chapter 5, verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm. Do not, subject, don't, do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Now, the last verse of Galatians 4, just so you get a little context here, we're not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. Hopefully, we all know that that's from Genesis 16. You guys know the story in Genesis 16? It's the story of an, a woman who's really upset that she can't bear children. Her name is Sarai, and she's getting old or older, and she can't have children. <laughs> And she's becoming, becoming increasingly frustrated. And if you know anything about the culture, when you couldn't have children, you're actually looked down upon as lesser of a woman. Now, thank God that that's not how we think now. But back then, that's how people saw it. And so she was so desperate for children, specifically to give her husband, husband Abram children, that she said, Abram, I'm going to let you have relations with my servant in order for you to have a child. So in some respect, when you think about the, the agony of not being able to have children and the pain of looking at your husband who's devoted to you and not having any children, you can kind of begin to at least have an, a glimpse of an understanding of what Sarai is going through. Now, I'm not sure any woman in this room would suggest to her husband what Sarai suggests to Abram. I just want to see a raise of hand. Would anybody have suggested that to their husband? Okay, so it's a pretty extreme thing. I, I think there's a lot of stories in the Old Testament that just really kind of freak me out a little bit. And, to the point where I'm like, is that real? Did that really happen? You know, And I, I think it's worthwhile to actually spend some time with Jesus and ask some of those questions because I think sometimes the stories in the Old Testament are less like actual reality show type stories and more about trying to paint a picture for us of who the Lord really is. Now, I'm not casting judgment on whether or not that story is real or not. I want to say this. It's the context for Galatians 4. 
Hagar was the name of the maid in which Abram did have relations with, and as a result of those relations, a child was born whose name was Ishmael. Okay? Because she was a maid, because she, she was actually, it, the Bible actually calls her a slave woman. You guys know that, right? Like, she worked for Abram and Sarai. That, that was very much normal back then to have slaves. In fact, in, many, in some parts of the world, it's still normal to have slaves. So, the bondwoman in Galatians 4.31, of course, is Hagar, okay? And the child of the bondwoman is Ishmael. Thirteen years go by in Sarai and Abram's life, and God visits Abram in a vision. And in the vision, God basically, I'm just summing this up, okay? You can go look at Genesis 16 and 17. I'm telling you a lot, stories you already know, but it's good to be reminded of some of our Sunday school stories, right? In the vision or in the word that God speaks to Abram, he says, the time has come. It's time for me to fulfill my promise to you and I'm going to visit your wife and you're going to have a child and she, or sorry, you're going to have relations with your wife and she's going to bear a child. And what's the first thing Abram does? You guys remember what Abram does? Yeah. So there's like this, come on, man. Like, seriously, do you know how old I am? Do you know how old she is? And, and God doesn't even, like, he doesn't even look at that question. Like, he's just, he's fixed on what he has purposed, okay? And this is so important for you guys. Guys, we will always try to throw up all the reasons why God's promises cannot be fulfilled now because of something that we either have done or the circumstances in our lives. And the Lord, back to this whole idea, we're always throwing up what's wrong or we're throwing up the challenges of why can't God do things? And the Lord's just looking straight through and saying, it's still possible. And so Abram, in the midst of all this, throws it up to the point where he says, you guys remember what he says? I remember my brother. He goes, oh God, let Ishmael live before thee. You guys remember that? Yeah. It's a powerful statement of someone wanting to cling to something lesser than in comparison to the promise God had always had for them. I think personally, we do that more than we want to give ourselves credit for. We tend to throw up, God, well, this will do. And the Lord says, no, I got more for you, Dylan. I have more for you than that. But Ishmael's a good guy. He's lived with me for 13 years. I've put my heart into him. I am convinced that this is the guy that it can be fulfilled. And the symbolism here that Paul is referring to is I can't fulfill my promise through slavery. This boy, this son of yours, as much as he is your son, he is from the lineage of slavery and he will have that mindset and he will pass that on to his children. And you got to think symbolically more than actual, okay? Because in the New Testament, it's much more looking at the Old Testament as a type and shadow. But this son, this son whose name is, how many remember the other son? Isaac. This son is born from you and your wife together. And he's born of the promise. He's born of faith. I mean, it probably took a level of faith for just, I don't know how many small kids are in the room, but for Abram and Sarah just to lay down together and said, hey, let's try it. <laughs> it takes a level of faith to say that when you're, how old was Abram? Anybody remember how old Abram was? 99 years old. Honestly, I don't remember. Honestly, I just remember 99. I don't know why that number. And it's almost like Abram left the 99 to go after the one. <laughs> Another free one. That was free for you. Freedom. God's purpose in that entire story was a people who would be free. And here we are, not just 3,000 years up to Jesus, but 2,000 years after him. And the idea of freedom is still paramount in the heart and mind of God. He wants his people free. Remember Moses walking up to Pharaoh? And what does he say to Pharaoh? Let my people go. 
Here we are. Fast forward thousands of years later, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. So, I wanted to give you context there about why Paul says at the end of Galatians 4, so then, brethren, we're not children of a bondwoman. We're not inheriting slavery. That's what he's saying there. We're not inheriting a lifestyle that's born of being under. This is really important. Freedom to the Lord, and I want to define that today so you can understand it. Freedom to the Lord is you are not under, you are over. You are not the tail, you are the... Come on, these are promises from the Old Testament. God sees us, and not just particular ones, not the chosen ones, but all of humanity as the one in, upon which he created just a little lower than Elohim. He looks at us this way. And he, I actually believe there's a part of his father heart that gets broken when we settle for Ishmael's, when Isaac is right there for us. And we say to him, dude, I am 99 and I ain't doing that. And he says, okay, settle for Ishmael, but you are not going to be happy. And then that's why I think it's easy for us to put off the reward of the Christian lifestyle to heaven one day. And we kind of create this Christian mindset of we just got to suffer through the things on this earth because one day. That's because we settled for Ishmael when Isaac is in our loins. Freedom available right now inside of you. And Christ created the opportunity for every one of us to experience that freedom. That promise that's in Isaac. So I want to define this word freedom for you from Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It was for freedom. It's the word, and I want to, I want to uh, I'm sure there's, I don't know how many Greek nerds there are in this room. Maybe I'm the only one. Eleutheria is the Greek word for freedom. And I want to define that for you, and I'm going to define it. I'm going to be a geek about this because I want you to understand the power of what Christ set you free for. In the most general terms, yeah, just leave that scripture up there. It was for an unrestrained life that Christ has set you free. It means unrestrained. Now, for a lot of us, the idea of unrestrained doesn't sound very good either, right? Hey, I can do whatever I want, but that's actually what the word means. Eleutheria means you are unrestrained. It means every chain broken. It means uh, uh, the reins on a horse. Is that the right term, reins? Like, help me out. Is, there, is that the right? Yeah, okay, thank you. Like, they're gone. Like the saddle is off, the bit is out of the mouth, the reins aren't there, and it's just a wild horse running free. That's what this word means. It was for that level of, you are absolutely free, go get it, that Jesus sets you free. But as I look into this a little bit more, here are some of the things that this unrestrained word means, because I kept digging. I'm not, I'm not even a partial geek, I'm a full out geek. It means I am responsible for my own decisions. That's what unrestrained means. Unrestrained means no one's going to make a decision for Mike Lynn. Mike's going to make it for himself. Jesus died so that you could make your own decisions. How's that feel? All of you should be saying this is really good. Because the, al the alternative is what? What's the alternative to you making your own decisions? <laughs> Someone else making them for you. To God, to, can you leave that scripture? I'm sorry, could you leave that scripture just so we can see? Yeah. To Jesus, his death was so that no one else could make decisions for you. That should be really good news. Because other people's decisions for you are not always with your best interest in mind. Anybody? Usually if someone wants to make a decision for you, it's for their best interest. But this freedom is you are responsible for your own decisions. I am not obligated to do what someone or something else tells me. There are no external requirements or demands on me. I must meet. That's freedom. Do you feel that? 
I want to read that again to you because this is what Jesus died for. You are not obligated to do what someone else or something else tells you. Someone say amen. Amen. That's the level of freedom Jesus did. On top of that, there are no external requirements on you. You can sit here, leave here, lay on the floor here, and no one can tell you you can't. Hello? You could bark like a dog right now, and we would not be able to tell you not to. I mean, we could, but you wouldn't have to listen. That's the level of freedom you have. Mark, I'm not sure I like this unrestrained life. Hold on. It means I, but here's the other thing that freedom means. As a result of not being obligated to something or someone else and not having any external requirements or demands on you that you have to meet, that means freedom also means I cannot hold someone else accountable for my free decisions. I want to say it again, because if you want freedom, you got to agree to this. You cannot hold anyone else responsible or accountable for the results of your freedom. You cannot blame somebody else if you want to be free. You're all just looking at me. All right. Freedom is an unrestrained life. Unrestrained also means moral license. I'm telling you, this is what the Bible actually says, unrestrained or freedom means. That means Orpah right now can decide what is ethically right for her. That's what the word means. I can decide what is good, what is right, and what is ethical for myself. How's that feel? Yeah. Everybody should be saying amen to this because this is good. Ultimately, the individual human being who's made just a little little lower than Elohim should have the right to determine what is right, what is good, and what is ethical for the world that you have actually been created to rule and have dominion over. I don't think any other creature on the planet should have that freedom, and Jesus doesn't think so either, and he gives it to Phil. Hallelujah. Phil can decide today what is ethical and right for who? For Phil. Now, based on that, don't forget, this is what freedom also means. I cannot hold someone else accountable for the effect of my ethical choices. Everybody, I just need everybody to say amen with me, please. Amen. Just because I choose my ethicalness. Is there another word for that? Ethicity. Ethic, ethics, thank you, ethics. Yeah, it's actually a class, forgive me. (laughs) My ethics and the results that the fruit of my ethics cannot be blamed on anyone else. Freedom demands that. Freedom says that if I choose that which is right, then I'm going to eat the fruit of my ethical tree. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's the last one, an unrestrained life. You ready? It was for this life that Christ set you free. Provision is based upon my capability, competence, and effort. In other words, freedom means I'm not looking for other people to take care of me. This is freedom. This is what the unrestrained life means. It means that someone else's care of me will not enslave me to them. It means that provision will be based upon my ability to tap into what's on the inside of. Oh boy, this is really important. This is the definition of the unrestrained life that Jesus set you free for. I'm telling you what the Bible says. You are called to this level of freedom. Which means, if provision is based upon our capability, competence, and effort, it means that I cannot allow someone else to do for me what I was created to do by God. If you allow someone else to do for you what's on the inside of you to do, that is not freedom. That is a level of slavery Jesus set you free from. Did you get that? If you allow someone else to do for you what's on the inside of you to do, that is slavery Jesus set you free from. I just want that to settle in. This is why 
Jesus set us free. This is why he tells us, keep standing firm and don't subject yourself again to a yoke of slavery. Guys, we have opportunity at every breath we take to take an easy road. I will tell you, an unrestrained life requires a lot of maturity. In fact, many people who yearn for an unrestrained life do not have the maturity to handle it. And as a result, they eat of their own decisions, their own ethics, or their own lack of provision. And as a result of that, they're hungry, and they're broken, and they're diseased. And when you're hungry, and you're broken, and you're diseased, you have a temptation. And it is strong to submit yourself to a yoke of slavery, because at least when I follow somebody else's rule, there's a level of, I'm being taken care of, I'm healed, I'm provided for, someone else's decisions are there. Now, now if something goes wrong, I can point there. Is this ringing true anywhere yet? That's how the Israelites felt. Man, it was, they could not wait to leave Egypt, and within moments of them being outside of Egypt, they were like, oh, is this what freedom's like? I really miss the leeks and the garlic. Guys, it was hours of them being free that they realized it was better for them to be in Egypt. Freedom is for the brave. Freedom is for the courageous. Freedom is for those who are willing to eat the fruit of their own decisions, their own labor, and their own ethics. Hello? Yeah. And this is the person Jesus died for. This is the freedom he wants to offer you. How are we doing so far? So Jesus makes us free. That's what, the, that's what that verse says, right? It was for freedom that Christ set us free. John 8 says that he made us free, right? That's what that word means in the original language. He made us free. He literally fashioned us free. That means we needed a liberator, first and foremost. It means that we were trapped, in order for someone to have to come and set you free, it means that at one point in time, you were trapped. Can we all say amen to that? I was, and I think we can all agree, at least in this room, that we were trapped in sin and we couldn't get out. We don't know how to get out. And so we in this room, that's why we gather on a Sunday morning like this, is we agreed that at some point in time in our lives, we realized that sin had power over us and there was only one way to freedom. And his name... Jesus. So he is our liberator and we are free. I want you to tell you that today. The power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible promises, is inside of you, which means you are free. That freedom is a finished work in you. You are a free person already. Everything I just described about you, that ability, that capability, that destiny is inside of you. You do not have to wait until you die and go to heaven to be free. Ah, oh, that's so exciting to me that the promise of heaven is awesome, but the promise of a free life is now. The promise of a heavenly life, which is complete and total freedom, is available now. Hallelujah. Freedom also means that I'm responsible for my own decisions and I get to decide what is good, right, and ethical for myself. That's powerful. Now, now we're in America. Let's kind of bring this into context. We're in America, well, temporarily in America, and we call this day not Freedom Day. You guys realize that, right? What do we call this day? Independence Day. Isn't that interesting? We call it Independence Day specifically. You guys know history, right? By the way, that's really disappointing. Do you guys ever watch those videos of people who walk around with a microphone on the streets asking people, like, what does Independence Day mean? Like, why do we celebrate Independence Day? And people, like, have no idea. I don't want to do that in this room, or do I want to do that in this room? Am I in a, I'm in a group of educated people that we all know that we were in independence from France, right? Wee oui, wee, oui. yeah. 
No, we were tired of the rule of a king who kind of had Ariana's accent. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) (laughs) Kind (laughs) of. We wanted our freedom. But what we call freedom, like we have correlated as Americans the term independence and freedom as the same thing. And I want to tell you, God does not look at it that way. God does not look at at freedom as independence. Because the term independence means I do not have to rely upon and I don't have to submit myself to anyone else. I am the sole determiner of my destiny, my happiness. And don't get me wrong, if you go and look at the sterile definition of that word freedom, you can infer that. I, I, I sterilely gave you that definition purposefully. I did not put it in the context of relationship with God because I wanted you to see how easily we could take freedom out of the context of the one who gave it to us and be independent. How you doing? You know, if you think about the Christian life the exact same as you think about raising children, Okay? How many people think it's a really good idea for your three, four, or five-year-old to be free and independent? Does anybody have a three, four, or five-year-old? Even maybe a 10, 11, 12-year-old? Maybe even a 17, 18-year-old? Like, we have children, and if you think about it, there's probably a period of time where it's legitimate that they shouldn't be free. Hello? Hello? But what every parent in this room would say that our goal is to eventually train and raise up people who are free from what? That's the question I want to ask you. Free from depending on us, okay? Somebody else. What are you raising up your children for? What's the goal? Freedom to... There you go. Freedom to be responsible for themselves. I like that. Somebody else? To think for themselves. To just think for themselves in general or to think for themselves well. Like, like, I think we need to frame that. Like we, have to, we need some adverbs in there because it's not just good enough, in my opinion, as a dad. Hey, think for yourself. Hope it works out. No, I think we have a goal in our training, don't we? Train up a child... Oh, that means there's some framework there, right? There's some context there. And God is the exact same way. So this idea of it was for freedom that Christ has set us free is not just a free, willy-nilly independence. I am free! I get to do what I want. I get to play with what I want. And I get to hurt you with what I play with. That's good. Hello? I think we have a tendency to think of it that way, though. But this freedom was meant to have a context. It was always meant to have a context. And I want to say, I believe it was meant to have a relational context. Because slavery is usually the result of, um, (coughs) excuse me, some level of unwillingness. Some willing of, some uh, context of command and obey. You guys with me? Like, the term slavery does not mean that we have usually a pretty healthy relationship. Am I right? Like, usually it's, you do this and you get this. And honestly, this is why he tells us to stand firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. But their freedom has a context biblically, and I want to talk about that. Jesus makes us free So we can live relationally submitted to someone who would never enslave us. I want to say that statement again because I think freedom was never meant to be independence. It was always meant to free us into a relationship with someone who would never enslave us. This is one of the reasons why I'm not a huge fan of the word obedience. Now, I'm mostly not a fan of it because now I'm a mature son. 
But when I was an immature son, obedience was a really important word. And for anyone raising young children, I think obedience is a necessary culture to develop in your family. When they are young, they need, when they hear mom or dad's voice, they need to immediately respond. And I think you can develop that. We taught our kids at a really young age, how many times should we say something? Once. If we have to say something two, three, or four times, it's probably we trained you to wait until the third or fourth time before something took place. Anybody else? I'm not trying to make this a parenting class. <laughs> but if our children at a young age learned to literally obey us the first time, we're creating a context where we realize that these people that we're being asked to obey have our best interest in mind. Hello? And so later on in life, as we become mature, I believe that freedom and obedience cannot be the same thing because, if, again, if the, if the context is like raising up a child, at some point in time, like my children now are pretty much all adults, like I'm not looking for obedience anymore from my children. That time has come and gone. I missed my opportunity if I didn't get obedience when I had the opportunity. Now that they're 20, ugh, 20 a lot, and yeah, like I missed that opportunity. Now all I have is relationship. And if I were to try and project something other than just the context of relationship onto my children, it is no longer relationship. It is slavery. And Jesus never would set you or I free for that purpose. That's why I don't think obedience is the best word to characterize our relationship with the Lord. However, for some of us, the idea of obedience to God is safe. And so we almost create like this welfare state context with relationship with God where I'm like, you know what, God? I'm your kid and you're my dad and you take care of me and you tell me when to turn right and you tell me when to turn left and you tell me when to stop and you tell me when to go and everything will be okay with my life. Hello? And it, that almost sounds holy. And to many of us, like, Maybe, maybe that's even to some level what we hope our relationship with God is. And I can tell you, I mean, I've been a long time a Christian now, and that's not the relational context I have with the Lord. He does not tell me what to do. And I don't think it's because I'm not listening. I spend a lot of time with the Lord. And there's some times where I feel really weak and afraid, and I ask him exactly what to do. Anybody else? And it's really frustrating when he does not answer me. Because I'm your kid, and you're my dad, and you're supposed to take care of me. But he is fostering a mature son. And he knows that he doesn't... Look, he set us free. It was for freedom that he set us free. And he's a good enough dad that he's not just going to pour out whatever I need when I'm in need or give me the answer I'm looking for if he wants me to be a mature son, one who is like him. How are we doing so far? Are we Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You guys hear that? It says if we didn't have freedom, then we couldn't love him. It wouldn't be love. It would be much more of a slave-master type relationship. So that's exactly right. It's, it's a freedom that causes us to fall in love with him. So I want to say that statement again, and I want to go into what it really looks like to have freedom in Christ. Jesus makes us free so we can live relationally submitted to someone who would never enslave us. And Father, I thank you so much that you have something so much better than slavery for us. I thank you so much, Lord God, that even though you see us in our frailty, that you do not take advantage of that frailty. Someone say amen to that. Father, I'm so thankful that you do not take advantage of our weakness and our frailty, but instead you come in and you empower us. The one who is our origin empowers us by his spirit to be everything he originally created us to be. That is freedom. The freedom Jesus provides us is complete, unrestrained access to the Father. There's your freedom. 
Your freedom is free, unrestrained access to the one who has everything. Hello? Oh, let me just keep going. Maybe we can put some context to it. The definitions of freedom still apply. Let's go back up to those sterile definitions of freedom. The freedom Jesus provides us is complete, unrestrained access to the Father. Now let's think about those three definitions of that word freedom from Galatians chapter 5. The definitions of freedom, responsible for my own decisions. Absolutely. Remember what the last fruit of the Spirit is? Self-control. I so bad, ever since I've ever started reading the Bible, I wanted that to say spirit control, or I wanted it to say God control. I wanted it to say something where Jesus was responsible for controlling me. Like, I really want him to do that. There's times where I feel so insecure about my ability to live this life well and to make the good decisions that I really just want God to just take over. Anybody? Like, I do not want to be in the driver's seat. I don't even want to be in the passenger's seat. I'm just going to go crawl in the trunk and just drive wherever you want, God. Anybody? And that almost sounds like a Christian life. In fact, many years ago, I think Wayne and I know this, there was a message by Parrish Reedhead. Do you remember this message? Ten shekels and a shirt. Go look it up. It's a powerful message. The problem is it's based on a completely, oh, I want to say vastly immature relationship with God where he talks about that we should literally be in the trunk of the car and let God drive wherever he wants. That's where I got that. When the reality is actually God wants us in the driver's seat. And if we can get to that place where we realize that God wants us to drive our own car and he wants to be that relational dad sitting right next to us saying, you've got what it takes. I love where we're going. What a great adventure we're on together. What do you think we ought to do now? And I look at him and I say to him, I don't know, what do you want to do now? And then he looks at me and he says, I don't know, what do you want to do now? And it's just like trying to ask your wife where she wants to go for dinner. (laughs) But somewhere in that dialogue is prayer. Somewhere in that dialogue is a transformation of my heart into his That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says. We behold him as in a mirror. And when we look at him, we see ourselves rightly. And we're transformed, that's what the Bible says, into the image we're looking at. That's the beauty of this relationship. He doesn't want to always tell you what to do. He wants you free to ask. And then after he says, hey, this is what I think, but what do you think? That's freedom. That's the relational freedom he died for us for. So, yes, you are responsible for your own decisions, but freedom in Christ looks like this. Hey, Dad, this is what I'm thinking. He wants to make our decisions with him. Like, you know, it's really okay, all of you married, like to come to a compromised decision with your husband or your wife. Now, for some of us, compromise just sounds like, oh, I lost For any of us stubborn people, if I don't get exactly what I think I should get, I lost. Anybody? Oh, y'all are so. (laughs) Yeah, but this is the beauty of the oneness of not just husband and wife, but father and child, is that as I like, I tell God this is the desire on my heart, but the freedom is, but freedom is also offered as much as it is enjoyed. So part of the freedom that Jesus died for us to have is that we free God to be himself in our lives. So here's real freedom as it relates to our relationship with God. Here's what I'm thinking, God. What are you thinking? Here's the problem. Many times we forget to ask that question. We just tell God, this is what we think or this is what we want. Stamp it, baby. That's not freedom. That's actually making God our slave. True freedom is, let's dialogue about this, Pops. I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking, but I want to hear what you're thinking. And in that process, he gives us the desires of our heart. Because our heart morphs and shifts according to the one we're in dialogue with. 
So uh, the second definition of freedom from earlier was moral license, the idea that I get to decide what is right and wrong. Here's true freedom. In that relational context, I am free to be with the one who authored my life. He's the one who spoke every cell of my being into existence. He should probably be the one I pass through. Here's what I think is right for my life. And then the author of my life should probably have a say it's probably a good idea to kind of find out who the maker of this computer, what the maker of this computer was thinking. Anybody else? Because here's the thing. The alternative is the one who was made, because you were made, then looks to other things that were made to try to find out what is right or wrong. And you're going to overwrite code with somebody else's code. And probably them, you're overwriting your code with their overwritten code. And possibly if it's generations long, it's so many overwritten code that you can't even hardly see the original DNA anymore. And that's why Jesus says, I'm going to set you free from all that, and I'm hitting the reset button. Boom, turn. Look at the one who originally wrote the code, and all the overwritten crap, even from generations, is removed. And it like there's a connection. That takes place. And now what is ethical and what is right and what is best for you becomes apparent. And then you are truly free. Huh? That sounds so good to me. I don't just want to be free so I can do whatever I want. I want to be free so I can do what's best for me. Amen? Finally, the last one was that that provision thing. I'm free to create my life. I am free to, uh, my provision is based upon my own capability, my own competence, and my own effort. Here's what freedom in Christ looks like. The one who is Jireh. Didn't we just sing on Jireh? The one who provides, the one who's like, man, I hope he comes through because otherwise I'm whatever. Jireh is the one who comes through. The one who, like in the, like when Peter is sinking in the water, Jesus reaches out and pulls him up. That's Jaira. Okay? So freedom in this is the one who is Jaira wants to teach us how to walk in the Jaira DNA inside of us. So when you're young, when I'm four, five, and six years old, mom and dad better be feeding me three meals a day. They better be putting clothes on my back. They better be giving me a warm place to sleep because I'm three or four or five years old. I don't know how to do that yet. When I'm 23, 24, 25, Jaira DNA better start kicking in because it's not good enough to spend the rest of my life hoping someone else will take care of me because God knows that's slavery and God knows that there is so much on the inside of us that slavery cannot tap into that you having to decide for yourself how to provide does tap into it. Freedom creates opportunity for you to have to figure it out yourself. I just want to tell you, it is okay for you to stand in front of something and not know what to do and figure it out. It is good for you. It calls on capability. It calls on ideas. It calls on creativity. Katie just shared about it. Mike had to pass away for her to realize what was on the inside of her. I'm not saying he had to, but when he did, something rose up. I have the ability to do this. I can carry this. This stuff's coming up on the inside of me. She is surprising the heck out of herself. That's freedom. Sometimes freedom feels like weight of responsibility. I think I'm going to say that again because I felt so good to say it. Sometimes freedom feels like responsibility. I need to take care of this. This problem is mine to solve. That's a true freedom cry. A true freedom cry isn't, let me go. A true freedom cry is, I can take these chains off. A true freedom cry is, I'm going to fix that problem. A true freedom cry is, I am the solution. Not just, look, I'm going to tell you. Slaves complain. I'm going to say it as clearly as I can. Slaves complain. Sons solve. 
That's the difference between the bondwoman's child and the free woman's child. And freedom rises up. When you decide that I'm not going to be a victim of circumstances, I'm not going to point the finger, and I'm not going to blame, or I'm not going to wait for just manna to fall from heaven. Because it didn't fall forever. You guys do realize that, right? It stopped, and they had, to, they had to figure out how they were going to feed themselves again after being fed. It's true freedom. What does biblical freedom really look like? It's a life free from rule of someone or something who doesn't have our best interest at heart. And I thank you, Jesus, for setting us free. The problem is many of us stop there. We're just so excited to be free from having to do what anyone else or what anything else tells us what to do. Back to the whole, I'm free, hallelujah. Real biblical freedom goes farther. It's a life relationally empowered by someone who does have our best interest at heart. It's our Father. It's after 12. I do have two more verses for you. If you're taking any notes, I don't know how many people are. Romans 8, 12 through 17 talks about freedom from the biblical perspective. We're actually led by the Spirit of God, and that brings freedom. And I did refer to 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, that we're being transformed into the image from glory to glory. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to stop there. Thank you for hearing me today. And I'm really thankful that we as Americans, you know, as I think about this country, I've traveled around the world. I haven't been in every country, but I've been in a lot of them. And I can tell you, there's no nation on the planet that seeks to provide freedom for their people like this country does. We don't have it perfect yet. But I can tell you, I've talked to enough people who have left their countries and come here and have so much honor and respect for an experiment called America. And at least we're trying. And that's the way they feel. And I, wanted to, I think I told you this when we came back from Portland. We were hanging out with all these Slavic folks who are just first and second generation here in America. And they were just like, they are taking absolute full advantage of the opportunities of freedom that are available in this country. And they are kicking tail. They own businesses. They're building houses. They're making wealth. And people who are multi-generations already in America are looking for handout. Honestly. And that's what happens over time. And I think this is some of the reason why we need to celebrate this incredible thing called America, called freedom, called this opportunity to pursue what we were created for. It's not perfect. I don't think the men that created it were perfect. I think they were flawed. They could have done better. But hindsight's 2020. But here we are, a lot later, and we still have this same freedom and this same opportunity to continue to improve upon what these guys started. So my hope as an American, let alone as a child of God, that we continue to foster in our nation and in just in our little community here, contexts of freedom, where everyone is responsible for their own way according to the freedom that Christ set us free for. Can you stand with me? I just want to pray. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I wanted us to stand today because I really wanted to honor you as the liberator. And maybe we've kind of forgotten a little bit the freedom bell that's on the inside of us that none of us in this room can claim victim anymore. None of us in this room can claim slave status anymore. We are free. Anywhere where we are enslaved, it's willingly. It's voluntarily. It's a decision we made to stay under. Holy Spirit, the very spirit of freedom come Remind us of the promises of God inside of us. Remind us of our identity that you told to Adam and Eve to have dominion, to rule, 
over all of this creation. Holy Spirit of freedom, remind us that we were made just a little lower than Elohim. Holy Spirit, would you come into our hearts and testify with our spirits that we are children of God, adopted, huiostesia, placed into the seat of our Father with Jesus. That we are seated in the one who has all authority in heaven and earth. Can we get any freer than that? And we take this freedom seriously. We're not casual about this relationship. We're not casual about this responsibility. We realize how important and valuable we are and what has been bestowed upon us. This is our inheritance. And we cannot take it lightly. And so, Lord, would you convict us where we play victim when we're really free? when we cry out and we pull out the slave card, when really, we're the master. We're the one with the authority. We just choose not to walk in it. Personally, relationally, collectively, even in our nation, may we not be ones that point the finger without first taking responsibility. May we not be the ones that want to complain and say what's wrong when we can first be the ones to say, here I am to help heal, to help solve, to help change. I am so free in my Father's Spirit that I can bow my knee and humble myself and say what I can change. That's how free I am. Free enough to honor. Free enough to respect. Free enough to celebrate another. May we steward our freedom well, Lord God. May July 4th not just be a day where we say we're independent, but may we truly declare our freedom with the way we live our lives. I honor you, Jesus. I honor you as the liberator. And I honor you even more so in living my life and submitting my freedom to the one who made me free. May I live according to that spirit. May we all live according to that spirit. I bless this family. I bless each one to walk in this freedom circumspectly, wisely, relationally with Holy Spirit. Carry it well, family. In Jesus' name, amen. I love y'all.